Who here wants to talk about an EIP? Just like raise your hand so we can like roughly keep track of time. One, okay. Two. Oh, come, if if you're in the back, it's not gonna happen. Yeah, you need to come, move come, forward. Come, come, yeah, yeah. Come. Okay. So sorry, I I didn't count because these guys were in the back. Uh, again. Perfect. Again. Okay. One, one and a half, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So we get like five minutes each. It's hard to like cap that. Okay, I can like yeah. keep the timer. Yeah, I can roughly keep track of time. Um, um, should we start? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. I'll start. I'll start on this side. Yeah. Okay. Hey guys. Um. I'm Sarah. I'm a smart contract engineer at Uniswap. Um. And I'm here with. I'm Mark, and I'm a protocol developer from Optimism. And um. <laughs> so we're gonna. Oh yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> we're in, we're done. Should I drop the mic? <laughs> um, cool, so we're gonna kind of tag team this EIP today. Um, yeah, first of all, I wanna thank you guys for hosting the session. I think it's super important that, you know, when we're planning for building open source software, we're really bringing a lot of diverse perspectives to the table. Um, you know, I think it, it's, you know, a lot of times client devs and core devs were, you know, focused on this really long-term vision for Ethereum and unfortunately for application developers that means some of the stuff we want to see does not get through um, and so hopefully I'm here today to convince you that this is worthwhile and actually this EIP really will complement the kind of future vision for Ethereum. Um, so let me hand this off to Mark to give a, a, little, a little rundown. Okay, so we're here today to talk about EIP 1153, which is transient storage. And this EIP adds two new additional opcodes to the EVM in this concept of transient storage, which is basically like a key value store per account. And any time that you, um, you know, you T store, you T load, which are synonymous to uh, S load and S store, but you, instead of putting it in a state, you put it into this transient storage map and each one is namespaced by the account and it persists throughout the duration of the single transaction's execution. Yeah, and so, so actually we have this concept of, um, you know, kind of storage is used sometimes in a transient way right now in the EVM. You can see this sometimes with like re-entrancy locks, right? So this is when we clear a slot back to its original value um, before the end of a transaction. And then, you know, we're allotted some amount of, of refunds. Um, and, you know, to achieve transientness in this way is actually quite messy. Um, from, you know, the developer point of view, um, you know, it, it's really not straightforward, you know, how the accounting will work for this, um, especially because refunds are now capped. Um, and so, you know, enshrining this directly in the EVM is, is a more direct uh, kind of use case to get transientness. Um, you know, also developers are kind of having to go and do this sort of messy implementation where you'll see a lot of times like, you know, one zero one instead of clearing to zero, we're clearing to um, some dirtied value because we actually end up getting um, you know more refunds in that case. And so it's really this sort of patchy way of achieving transientness in the EVM. Um, and so kind of the way that that we look at this EIP is actually sort of a cleanup. It's it's relieving some of this tech debt here um, because this is a real use case and it is wanted. So one really cool side effect of this is it actually helps a lot with parallelization because um, you know we want to we want to scale Ethereum we want to increase the throughput of the system and we can do that by parallelizing the EVM and right now any time that there is um, a lock taken in a contract it is writing to storage and that prevents parallelization of that transaction with other transactions that are trying to interact with the same contract. So if we move all these into transient storage instead, then we'll be able to paralyze a lot more transactions. And it's important to try to get this change in sooner rather than later so we can start adopting this pattern now and have more of the network using this kind of way of, of doing locks so that we can um, have more parallel execution in the future. Um, another problem is that it's really difficult to know um, how much gas or, or how much gas is going to be used when you're allocating memory because there's this like crazy nonlinear function. So this makes it much more straightforward because every you know T store uses the same amount of gas. 
So it's easier for a developer to like know how much gas they're going to be using when they're writing their smart contracts. Cool, and, and kind of on the on the last note here, I just want to reemphasize that this is not necessarily an addition to the EVM. It's it's really we're thinking about it as a cleanup, a, a cleaner way of of achieving this use case in the EVM. Um, I also want to point out this is a really siloed change. It's two op codes. It's easily testable. Um, and uh, also benefit, it's already been implemented across four clients. So Nethermind, Bezu, Ethereum JM, or Ethereum JM VS, and uh, also Geth is implemented. We've also written tests for this. They all pass. Um, and so the, the kind of the final ask today is to just really get some more client dev eyes on these PRs, on the tests we've written, and to actually kind of seriously open this conversation of having CFI for 11.53 in Shanghai. Um, thank you. I guess just to make sure we have time, like, are there like a couple client devs with strong opinions about this? We probably can't do everyone, but uh, okay, Daniel first. I have a meta opinion on this. I think it's awesome that people from outside the core team are not just writing the spec, writing the implementation, but also writing the tests. I mean, big round of applause. Woo -hoo! Any other comments? So, um, all in all, just FYI, I do like the EIP. However, um, I kind of have a feeling that uh, the rationalizations are not necessarily all equally valid. With the parallel execution, I think that's kind of a far away dream. So, I, I yeah. I mean, it, it, essentially, every time you execute a transaction, you will touch some state. So, if it touches the same contract, you will touch the state, some state anyway. So, that I don't think it helps there. However, I, I mean, personally, I think it might be nice. One thing it would be, yeah, let's just keep it at that. <laughs> but you. I, I don't really see the point, but I'm also not a, not a, not a, a contract developer. Um, it seems to me like a nice to have, but nothing that's critical for, for us right now. So I can rebut that. Um, one of the one of the points that I do like about it is that with um, with these mutexes, essentially, it touches the state, and even if it does nothing, just flips some bits back and forth, it still has to touch disk, and this would allow us to do these things without touching disk. So that's a net benefit for me. Have you talked to the Solidity team yet? There is an open draft PR with the assembly opcode in the Solidity repo right now. Um, yeah. Uh, so, like, as for the parallelization, there has been quite a lot of work in analyzing how, how much the transaction can be parallelized. And even at Flashbots, we were running the analysis of the of the clashes, the, the bundle clashes, the transaction clashes. So, so I think uh, any improvements in this would, would be quite nice to see. Uh, there are some builders there. Like, I've seen actually the, the modifications to Geth that were introducing parallelization and they were working and I was really surprised like how some developers were able to, to do that in their own um, in their own implementations just for the simulation efficiency. Uh, so there are already gains from parallelizing transactions, such as the, the implementations that are so complex and so specific for, for searching uh, that they are not coming to the general view. Uh, so it'd be great to see that. Uh, I think the pitch was really great. <laughs> so I, I was not considering this one because I was always thinking that anything that was touching the storage was awful amount of testing and huge risk of, of something escaping and, and some contract breakages. So, so this is my biggest worry. Like we were modifying the cost of storage in the past, we were modifying the behavior of refunds. Um, and, and this one feels a bit like that. Like when you say, Oh, it's a it's a known cost, but do we do we cap the the storage? Okay, I see. Yeah, re refunds are capped. No, they they start transient storage because if it's not capped, it again it should be exponentially growing. And it's it's the same. It doesn't exponentially grow, but we looked at it to see kind of you know the upper bound, and it seemed like it was safe. But it's the same with memory, right? Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, so with memory we have the exponential cost, and here we have the linear one. Yeah. So I guess just to wrap it up, sorry, to try, but like, is there something that any, like we have tests for this, we have uh, implementations. Oh, I guess my question is like, from the client teams very quickly, is there something like you want to see from here, like a big open question you have about this? I know you have the solidity question, but like, yeah, just to wrap it up, anything you wish you would see from this that would help you better understand? Do you have uh, tests or benchmarks for like just writing as much uh, to the storage as possible, writing in, uh, uh, in uh, like small chunks into it, doing uh, doing separate calls into different um, different contracts that each write their own? Uh, I would really like to see this. Yeah, there's an open PR in the Ethereum test repo. I think most of those cases that you just said are covered. I haven't looked in a bit, but um, yes, reentrancy I think is covered. Um, I, I'm happy to share that out with with the wider group. But there's extensive tests. Something that I did want to do is use Felix's memsize library and basically just like look at the gas limit and just like, you know, fill in as many things as possible that would fit in the gas limit and then like observe the size um, in the implementation itself. Um, I have that like on my like computer someplace, but it's like not really pushed, but that is like something that we could add, <clears throat> add to make it better. Oh, one last question, okay. I just had a comment on the solidity part. Um, adding it to the assembly, well, the PR, there wasn't a PR, we just added it, but um, <clears throat> it's easy to add the opcode, and you can use it in an inline assembly. Um, and if the EIP goes live, that's going to be added like instantly. But adding it into the language is going to take quite a bit because it's a lot of changes. Um, I don't expect it to, to happen anytime soon. Um, so if you guys want the help in implementing it, which may take like thousands lines of code, um, that would be welcome. Cool. Okay, we need to wrap this up. I'm sorry, but uh, Igor, you're up next. Thank you. My name is Igor Ilovoy. I'm a Solidity developer, and I'm here to champion EP 3978, entitled Gas Refund and Reverts. So motivation for this uh, EP is that uh, revert, revert of a transaction or any its subcalls drops any state modifications, but uh, the user has to pay the full price for these state modifications, while um, these state modifications are not uh, preserved for forever. And this has uh, two um, problems with this, is that users overpay and then it limits uh, some uh, solidity patterns where you may, may have a call and revert it and um, it makes it extremely expensive to the point where sometimes instead of reverting a call, you may just like transfer EC tokens from one address to another just to like restore the storage instead of uh, paying the higher gas price of uh, reverting the call. And in my opinion, it's an anti-pattern because some side effects can be missed and it may result in uh, uh, critical hacks and loss of funds eventually. And this AP suggests to uh, reprise the following OP codes as a S store create self destruct uh, through the gas refund mechanism. So they're not going to be free. You're still going to pay some price for touching uh, these addresses or storage variables. But it seems unfair to pay a full price. Uh, this AP is uh, in an early version. So I just want to spread more awareness around this problem and to hear what kind of comments people have. Thank you. Uh, question, uh, I'm, maybe I missed something, but um, is the suggestion essentially to reprice some of these storage opcodes or? Sorry for uh, the clarity. So if, let's say, if S load operation, not S load, S store operation inside the reverted transaction uh, costs uh, 22,000 and then this, um, uh, this call reverts, then the cost of this operation should be repriced as just like a, a touching this load for 
uh, a different number. So you should not pay 22,000 for modifying a storage slot, which is not modified at the end of transaction. And the pricing should happen through the gas refund mechanism. Uh, does it bring any clarity? So I, I have comments about like the, the general idea. So um, it mostly means you would need to remember all of the changes you've done. And then it's like single point when the reverse goes, you would need to go through all of the changes and apply, uh, compute at least the, the refund you, you get from that. So like you have like single operation that it's actually like unbounded in the complexity internally. And that might be like doable if you have this journal journal implementation of the state because you do also the like unjournal the the changes. But if someone has different implementation of that, it might be really difficult to implement. And just one more comment that um, usually with when rev revertals you can actually have nested revertals and you that can end up quite nasty when. You have sub calls that revert, then the outer call doesn't revert, then the outer call again reverts. So it's not a very, very easy EIP to tackle. It might not be too hard, but it's. I think to reason about it is not necessarily easy. Yeah, I think the, the, if if like the this assuming that we have the, the keep the journal all the time and use it for all the, all, all the other oper operations and. Uh, it kind of that this idea fits into that perfectly. I think that might be considered, but if there is something that you would need to keep different data structure just for that, I think it would be really difficult to have it. And I know some of the implementations actually don't use the state journal, right? I mean, that's not something we mandate to, to be used. So you would need, like in other words, you would be forced to keep something like that anyway, although it's not required uh, in particular right now. You have to keep track of a whole lot of information for um, for the uh, for the refunds anyway, for the, for the storage refunds anyway, so it's the same stuff in all implementations. I think whether it's journal or cash, you have all the info you need. Um, but I'm just still traumatized by some of the code I had to write for the um, for when we were doing the the, the repricing of, of the the 2200, um, I can't remember the exact name of the of it, where it was overfitted fitted to Geth, and um, our code analysis tool freaked out at the complexity of the code. So I'm kind of concerned about that, about the maintainability of some of these. I mean, I was implementing the algorithm as specified, and Sonar said that's too complex; you can't do it. Actually, um, it, it was it was the same uh, EIP transient storage. Um, so without maybe just reviving you know everything and, and reiterating everything there, um, it just just kind of adding on a few points. One, um, you know, right now some of the higher level oh sorry uh, background. Uh, so I'm actually a contributor to the Hoff language, which is a low level uh, assembly language, and then uh, formerly um, you know, I worked with the Superfluid protocol. And so I think I think both of these could benefit from uh, transient storage. So on the Huff side, um, you know, higher level languages like Solidity and uh, Viper, you know, they have these reentrancy locks or, or modifiers to facilitate reentrancy locks that you know are very well built, and it's very easy to build this in a safe and secure way. But when it comes to assembly languages, this is actually a problem because if you set a lock in storage and you don't explicitly free it by the end of the transaction, those are now bricked, which obviously you should catch this in, in unit tests, right? But it's just, it's one more foot gun on the stack. Um, Sorry to interrupt you. I think you're kind of uh, capturing the, the governance process right now because we already talked about this EIP and now rehashing the uh, discussion is kind of, I think, not great. Uh, so I would, if the, if, uh, I would rather move on with the next EIP and uh, because we discussed this one already. I do think, I, uh, sh yeah, I think we should move on because we have it done. I do think though it is valuable to know that like low level languages and like uh, projects like this, uh, if you can like write it on the ETH Magicians poster somewhere. We, we can also, we can also, if all of the EIPs were done, we can also 
Yeah, yeah, we could go. We're, we're not going to be done early, though. Put the microphone, um, please. Yeah, sorry. So, so I was going to say, yeah, yes, we, we probably don't have time to, to rehash it. If, if, But it is valuable. I do think, like, putting it in writing on the East Magician's Pills is probably good to document. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, also, yeah. the microphone, don't be scared. It's mainly for the recording. Okay, cool. Sorry. Do you have any IP as well? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm working on um, 5027. Um, and also another EIP 5478. So I just discussed 5027 first. Uh, so basically, it uh, aims to remove the, uh, right now, the contract limit that is 24 kilobytes uh, that was introduced okay. in uh, uh, EIP 170. Um, so uh, the reason is, like, I think the motivation is pretty clear that a lot of people complain regarding 24 kilobytes uh, contract size, especially right now the contract is significantly much more complicated when EIP uh, 170 was introduced. Um, so the major concern of uh, EIP uh, 170 is basically DDoS attack. Uh, if a large contract maybe fixed 100 kilobytes that was deployed on Ethereum, then uh, if it just charging using a flat fee, like for example right now is 2,600, then it may uh, significantly, significantly undercharged. Um, so uh, basically the idea is like right now the solution basic is that I split the contract to multiple contracts and then I call kind of like chain of contracts so that I can retrieve a lot of data um, but it basically uh, make the whole logic much more complicated. Um, so the current um, my idea of solving this EIP uh, basically the DDoS tech um, there are two ways. One is to basically introduce uh, basically a uh, contract code hash versus the to the contract size. So when we call a contract, then we immediately to know basically the size because size is very small, like four bytes number, then we are able to pre-charge according to, uh, for example, what the actual size of the contract is. Like maybe we can just pre-charge uh, charge 2,600 per 24 kilobytes so that we are able to basically have similar um, right now gas behavior of calling multiple contracts, but just put in a, in a single contract. Um, so this is one idea. Another idea is we can, if the contract size is greater than 24 kilobytes, then we are able to append a size together with the current 24 kilobytes and then tells them what's the actual size it is. And when, when the first time it calls, it first charge 2,600 about the, the first 24 kilobytes and then the, the contract size. And then once we know contract size, then we can further charge uh, the corresponding, the rest of contracts and then put in the memory and then execute. So basically this is the basic idea uh, when we basically ex uh, explore the EVM code and also I have a simple basic implementation uh, together with some uh, concerns of addressing warm and cold uh, storage. Um, also a big concern of the P2P package size because right now um, we have a limitation on the P2P package size um, but with for example 50 million gas uh, block gas limit divided by 200 gas price per byte uh, so the contract limit size actually is essentially limited to 250 50 kilobytes um, so right now that's still fit into the P2P package um, so the bas basically these are a couple of concerns that regarding this if we are able to uh, remove this limit. Yeah, happy to. So um, there's also EIP 3970, not 3978, um, 3860, which is to limit and meter and NIC code, which is like we got two conflicting EIPs. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not opposed to changing the limit, but completely unlimiting it, I think it has issues. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's Martin that has some really glorious code that um, shows some performance problems with the current jump analysis on, on um, the legacy formats. Um, but another thing to consider is what if we change the code to require it to be done in the EOF and it's the code limit it applies to and then we could reconsider how much data you could bring in that is not subject to this because you're not supposed to do the jump analysis on the data. The jump analysis is different in EOF too. There's not the same risks. Um, but then as you mentioned you get into the issues of um, how does it impact the storage bringing out you know kilobyte, not kilobyte, megabyte Code, code out of the storage um, and yeah, I, I think the unlimiting is going to be a hard sell. I think changing the limit I think is going to be an easier sell. I guess my question is kind of similar to this that uh, saying that 24k is too small 
I can definitely accept that. I think that's a valid concern. My question is, what is reasonable? Because if uh, if you go towards saying that, well, it should be arbitrarily large and it will get so complicated that it definitely won't ship. But for example, saying that, well, let's raise it from 24 to, I don't know, 64, that's, that thing can be analyzed. There we can put a number on it. It doesn't mean that it won't require additional changes, but it's relatively simple to understand the implications. The moment you introduce these dynamic changes, I think that's, that's not really going to fly. It's going to be too complicated, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, be, um, so because I do some experiment and I'm uh, using the code, so right now I feel like for example, in the synchronization and pull large, deploying a large, uh, like for example, 200 kilobytes of contract on top of that, uh, it looks like everything is uh, working fine on my testnet. Um, so it uh, has been running for um, more than half years. Um, yeah, especially like right now the gas meter regarding the jump analysis. Right now the gas metering is charged for two thousand six hundred per twenty four mm -hmm. kilobytes, which essentially I think the is uh, equivalent to I call this contract and call another one. And this contract call another one. Right. So basically, I charge this the chain of this calling to in a single, but you, you using, using a single uh, payment. So so if we tie this to EOF, um, you can have larger contracts if you do it in an EOF container. We simultaneously solve the, the jump test analysis problem and uh, reasons to motivate people to use EOF. So I, I think there's a lot of things we could combine and trade some horses to make this work. Yeah. I, I, oh, yeah. Just a minor point of trivia over why 24 kilobytes was chosen as well. It was a convenient representation. I think it was 2 to the 6 plus 2 to the 7. And at the time of the gas limit, it wouldn't have broken any contracts because it was impossible to reach that. So. I think it's not possible to do this on uh, on uh, mainnet right now, and I think it's also not possible to to increase the code size. Uh, if you're a client dev and you're interested about my reasoning, come talk to me uh, afterwards. Um, what is possible is to do it in EOF, and I think that's what you what you should uh, strive for. Uh, do it in EOF when we have uh, the the jump this stuff. Cool. Okay, last comment. Uh, uh, just a tiny, tiny bit of comment. You mentioned that uh, you had a test set up and running, and it's been running perfectly. The with all these changes, the catch is it's uh, the average case. We know that it runs perfectly yeah. because the code is written well. The problem is how attackable it is, and yeah. in your private test set, nobody's going to attack it. Okay. Cool. cool. Thank you. Um, Denkrad, did you have any IP? Do you want to talk about self-destruct? Who's the self-destruct guy, Proto? Okay, uh, hello everyone. I'm Proto, I work at OP Labs. Um, we have this dream of Serenity. Serenity included proof of stake and sharding. We have achieved proof of stake. I want to continue with sharding. I'm fully bought into the Ethereum for the, this combination, not for one and not the other. And I think right now the process with EIPs has been like kind of imbalanced with the merge because we have an exclusion layer, consensus layer. I think an EIP that does both of these and actually does touch on the testing infrastructure is the thing we need to repair it. Right now the merge was I think still shipped in a relative hurry but with scaling we have actual incentives outside of just client teams to improve this infrastructure, to improve analysis of Ethereum, to improve integration testing. And so we can get the best of both worlds where we can improve Ethereum and we can improve the process that we have to accept EIPs and so that we can be happy to enter future EIPs without as much concern because we have the right testing in place. And then outside of testing and the whole process, just the case for 4844, if you're not familiar already with 4844, it increases the data for layer two. Layer two um, is meant to be an extension of Ethereum. You could think of the previous sharding dream of Ethereum as this execution sharding thing where it was effort, all the complexity lived on Ethereum itself. Layer two enables this to be more competitive and to be split from Ethereum 
where we have exclusion layer as layer two, and we have the layer one just focus on the securing data availability. And this is what this EIP focuses on and achieves. And then through this means we can adopt a lot more Ethereum users onto layer two and projects like, like Coinbase or other like larger Ethereum users won't have to look at these Ethereum killers in quotation marks where we can actually host these users at low cost. Um, just because we talked about it a bunch before, um, the client teams have anything else to add or? Numbers, numbers, numbers. Okay, <laughs> you heard it here. Um, yeah, just I want to make sure we can get to as many people in the next 20 minutes as possible. Or Dankrad, were you going to add something on? Uh, I think I've already said the main things I want to say. But yeah, once I've distracted, I think Marius has the pitch. Oh. <laughs> well, do you want to do the pitch, Marius, or do you want to listen to more of the other pitches? Um, we should remove self-destruct. Um, yes, that's the pitch. <laughs> we agree. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, and we need, we need to remove self-destruct for vertical and history expiry and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, state expiry and all of these upcoming changes. So it needs to be done. Uh, the question is, do we, do we do it now or do we do it later? And I think it's uh, it's a really small change, uh, so we should do it now. For legacy and EOF or just EOF? For legacy and EOF. So just to, I think this, uh, if somebody is not really on the page of why we want to remove self-destruct, essentially uh, every single opcode on the EVM is the cost is linear, or I mean, tries to approximate the actual execution that the resources it consumes. And self-destruct is one of those opcodes where um, deleting the contract story essentially it's a, it's a single opcode call but it can result in an arbitrarily large execution and uh, currently the only reason why currently it works is because self-destruct assumes that clients represent the state in a specific way in the Merkel Patricia way and it, it also assumes that the state does not get deleted from disk it's just a couple of branches of the Merkel Patricia gets updated but the moment you want to do something fancier like what Aragon is doing or what Gas New Pruning is doing, essentially self-destruct will become a, a, lin a completely unbounded uh, opcode. And that's, it prevents us from going forward with in the implementations. Imagine self-destruct on USDC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do a Sorry? Yeah. And, and to like make this uh, add to this, like uh, if you want to be stateless, it would be an unbounded number of state changes and that completely kills statelessness. So yeah, I have only the comment that um, the current self-destruct has a quirk that you can destroy Eve with that. And the question if, is if we want to actually like to make the, the send all work the same way or we want to kind of fix it and make, make it more intuitive i think so i think it's kind of the the choice between like more backwards compatibility between something that is more obvious how it works oh. so the way i implemented it now it um just it doesn't destroy the ether uh, so it, it, it w and, and and the idea for so everyone like defined by the implementation right yeah, yeah. <laughs> because like okay. you, the first implementation wins. Yeah. Okay, and like. and uh, yeah. for everyone in the room, we are not trying to remove self-destruct, but we're changing it uh, so that um, so that uh, the self-destruct will just send all of the ether um, that is in the contract, um, and the, but the contract itself will stay, and so so it's like it, it will keep the the current way. The only the only thing that is kind of iffy about it is there's some pattern where you self-destruct and create uh, to uh, uh, a contract, but there have been an, an analysis about it and it doesn't break too much stuff. <laughs> and, 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 we, and we talk to the people that, that, we, that we would break with it and uh, they seem to be okay with it. How did Gas Token take it? <laughs> no, no, we're not going to. <laughs> um, okay, uh, beside you, Proto. Uh, yeah, sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, you want to take that mic? Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Ronan. Uh, I basically build uh, on-chain games. 
and basically app engine also was the application uh, many things actually but um, and by that I mean application or game that have a zero backend and where uh, the user player uh, provides their own node through the wallet they choose and in that context um, I am building an indexer that runs in the browser um, and so um, it can fetch the logs and it will all fine uh, and but some application or game rely on time uh, information and uh, most developers uh, assume rightly that the timestamp is available and so they don't need to add a timestamp in the event that they emit. Uh, unfortunately, the logs uh, don't contain uh, the timestamp information uh, and so in my game, for example, I like 20,000 events. I can fetch them very quickly, like in five seconds, if all, all the state is synced. But if I have to uh, add the timestamp, then I need to make 20,000 more requests. And uh, I can't even batch it because uh, EIP1193, which is the only uh, interface uh, uh, I have, cannot do that. So the idea is it's a very simple proposal is simply to add the block timestamp in the logs object uh, when you query the logs. And actually someone also said we could also add the timestamp to the transaction received, etc. Uh, but basically, yeah, adding the timestamp information. So one of my uh, questions here is that um, long term, the essentially long term Ethereum attempts to remove access from old chain segments. And ideally, I would also completely remove access from lo accessing logs that are older than I don't know, I would remove, I would say a month, three months, something fairly high. So uh, essentially, is it, I mean, is it already a consensus? Because are we talking, because like, I feel we are talking now about another thing, like, it, so I, the, I understand the, kind of what you mean, but it feels like. So what I was getting at is that uh, this is kind of a consensus in Ethereum that the, ch the past chain segments need to be pruned, otherwise the, the network implodes. And in from that perspective, uh, the amount of logs you will have to access is more limited, so it might not be that big of an issue not to. So, I mean, you could al always retrieve the timestamps if if you have a bounded number of logs you can access. Don't you think that if we go to that stage, uh, the the wallet interface will also evolve uh, with a different mechanism so that the application can remain decentralized, or are you giving up on complete decentralization? from the application point of view. I'm, I don't understand what uh, Because the like is. W most application, we kind of, as a developer, we, we understand that we need to index the data and that's why we use event. Um, but, okay, so I think events are completely being misused and they are used as a database instead of events. And uh, in my opinion, Ethereum should use it as events and uh, should, everybody else should adapt, but that's my two cents. What, what, what do you mean by using as event? So by event, I mean that the DAP emits something and anybody interacting with the DAP can react to it within a specific time frame, but not to look up events that happened 10 years ago, because that's that's not an event, that's a kind of a database at that point. Yeah, I mean, I have other comments to make, I, because I think it's a bigger discussion, like a lot bigger than what we have time for now, but because I've, we have all application rely on this. So the reason why we use event as a database is because, um, I mean, the typical example is the NFT. If you want to know the list of the token you own, uh, you can add, and a lot do that. They have this call, further call to fetch all, you know, by providing the starting index and the length at which, and, and you can do that, but it adds gas cost to the implementation. And many decide actually to not do that and use the event. And I feel it's, it's an, I mean, I feel normal to, to, to do that. And I feel we need to have a discussion about how do we will deal with that for applications that really want to remain decentralized. Have you looked at using the GraphQL APIs? Because I think you can go into a block from a log and then you can get the timestamp and you can do it in one step. Yeah, but GraphQL is not part of EIP 1193, which is the only thing I have access as an application. Uh, the GraphQL is, there's a standard for the GraphQL and it is in the execution APIs. So. Um, Geth and Basu both implement it, can expose it. But you have, I think what is important here is that I don't have access to a node. 
the only interface we have for application is EIP1193. So I, I'm fine to have actually add a, a further EIP to solve this using GraphQL as a mechanism so, by which... Sorry, sorry to jump in here, but um, just because this is not like a core, it, it does touch on the core, but we're going to have a whole session about ERCs on Friday. Okay, yeah. um, it's an infrastructure issue. Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, uh, and, and I agree with you, there's like a longer discussion about like how applications use this stuff, but I think, yeah, that's probably a really good one to discuss on, on Friday. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that will be at 1 p.m. I'm not sure where, but it's on schedule somewhere. Yeah, it's on. A, there's not a lot of stuff on the schedule Friday. Anyway. Yeah. Um, Matt, did you have one? I have an EIP. <laughs> I'll, okay. I'll try. You, you get a minute. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it short. I'll keep it short. Um, so my name is Matt. I am an author of EIP 3074, Auth and Auth Call. More to the mic. I thought she was going to take it away from me. <laughs> You're finished now. Um, yeah, so EIP 3074 adds two new opcodes, Auth and Auth Call. The motivation of the EIP is to improve the user experience of Ethereum. I think if you're using dApps today, you're realizing you're signing tons and tons of things when you're interacting with a single dApp and the flow that we have is not the best. And with Auth and Auth Call, we're providing a very generic framework for dApp developers to define like multi-transaction flows uh, in a way that uh, allows users to sign just a single message. And they don't need to use any kind of smart contract wallets. They get these types of benefits for free without deploying any smart contract wallet. That's one reason. Another reason that I think the EIP 3074 is very valuable is it lets all users of EOAs sign a message to create some sort of social recovery mechanism. And if they happen to lose their uh, MetaMask or their Ledger or, or whatever wallet that they're using, they can go and recover it with the people that they signed through. And the third thing I think is really interesting with 3074 and is a testament for like how powerful it is, is a proposal that Alex came up with, um, maybe, I don't know, maybe last year about replacing the WETH ERC20 token with a, a contract that uses the IP 3074 to natively move the ether balances around whenever you're, you're interacting with the ERC20 token. So that's the, that's the pitch. Daniel. Um. <laughs> There is some huge user experience risks with it as currently done, and the revision took some of the guardrails off. So um, we don't have enough time to go into some of those, those, those issues with safety, and those are, I think, my number one concern on that right now. But if we need meta transactions, let's make a meta transaction, uh, transaction format. In, okay. in some of the other ones, you know, account abstraction, EIP I think account abstraction can solve that, and that's something we know we want to do. Yeah, okay, so the, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Marius was the giant man, they're on the same team, we have 10 minutes left, sorry, no. Um, what we'll, what I'll, I will give a shout out, there is an account abstraction panel, I think Matt, you're on it uh, later this week, so if you want to go ahead into a heated debate about the various flavors of account abstraction and fake account abstraction and 3074. Right, um, we'll have a whole hour to debate it. Yeah, so. yeah, so let's, okay, cool. Can you raise your hand if you still had an EIP? Uh, uh, Alex, you don't have one? Yeah. Okay, just... Oh, no, sorry, I mean, oh, I mean Alex B. Oh. In front, Axic. <laughs> no, okay, no, okay, cool. Uh, How about a... Wait, wait, wait. But... Well, did, did, he, did he have it? Did... No, no. <laughs> uh, How about... Did you have one? Like a half-ish. Okay, Dano, do you have a full EIP? I have three of them, but I only want a quick yay nay. Okay. I also have a quick one for a yay nay. Okay, Dano first, and there we finish with Matt. So okay. I just I just want to get a temperature check on the three other EOF ones on EOF function, static relative jumps, and stack validation. Damn. Good idea, bad idea, too complex. That's really all I'm looking for. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So the first one is EOF functions where we'd have the call f and we'd split it up in different functions and have multiple code segments. Good idea, bad idea, too complex? Okay. Static relative jumps where it's an immediate operation. You say jump ahead 10. Yes? Okay. Good idea. And the stack validation, um, which needs the functions where you can say that this function is only going to take five stack items. 
and if it goes and it's not going to overflow. So you could remove the overflow check. My thought on that is it's a bit complex to get into Shanghai. So that's I want to see if I'm the only one of that opinion. I wasn't saying that the other stuff should go into Shanghai. I think it's it might be a good idea in the future. Good idea, just Cancun or later. I, I, so cool. So no one actually proposed EOF. Um, so no, I UF, guess EOF is is, uh, is approved for inclusion. Oh, but oh, I just oh. wanted a temperature check, so let's not discuss it. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. These aren't in yet. Okay. So yeah. I was just. Uh, okay. Can I like like one comment is like if you combine functions and relative jumps, you can re get rid of of uh, jump this analysis entirely because they kind of replace that. Um, and um, unless we get rid of the jump code too. Um, the jump what? Jump and jump I, we'd have to get rid of those to get rid of jump test analysis. Yeah, like remove all of these. We can do that with this, these two features. But uh, like the way we didn't champion it, like because I think that's not on us to like actually say it's great because we need input from people that say they want to use that. Uh, but thanks for mentioning. And yeah, we'll have EVM panel on Friday as well. I do have another EIP. I didn't want to like talk with the UF because we spent like two hours on like protocol workshop. Um, but this EIP is really cool. It's called mCopy for memory copying. It's not merged yet because of the EIP process, but um, I'm going to summarize it. So basically, the only way to copy memory right now, there are two ways. Uh, one way is to do it with the loop, m store, m load, m store. And that was already recognized and the identity precompile was introduced. Um, I think the first like few months after the launch of Ethereum, that was used by the Solidity compiler. But then with the Shanghai attacks, it was repriced. Um, the call was becoming too expensive. So nobody used the identity precompiler anymore. It is just there. I think Viper uses it now, but Solidity still uses the loop. Um, so then the memcopy opcode fixes all of this. And I just I'm trying to read the numbers. So. Yeah, it takes like 800 gas to, to copy 255, 256 bytes. Um, um, with the Shanghai cost, with the recent cost, it's 160. With the mLoadM store, it's 100. Um, and with the IP, it would be 25, byte, 25 gas. Uh, we did some analysis. Um, I think like 25% of all the memory copying would be improved by mCopy. Um, and there's actually one feature in this little compiler, which is kind of be, I mean, it's not blocked by this, but it's not implemented, um, slicing of memory arrays. And a lot of cases, people are doing like forcefully using call data stuff um, because that can be sliced in the compiler. So having mem copy, a cheap mem copy, uh, would also improve Solidity as a language. That's it. Yes, the reason I said that half EIP, because um, it's almost certainly not for Shanghai, but I don't think it's been talked about at all. And it's nice to like um, get people's brains brewing on it. So um, first of all, the one is based on is ERC4337, right? Which is, um, so I mentioned the kind of abstraction. That's like a way of getting a kind of abstraction without requiring a hard fork to avoid all this like EIP process mess. Um, and, um, this, we, we found that people quite like this approach, right? Because um, they can already start using their smart contract vaults. But we found that users actually still complain quite a bit about um, smart contract vaults because um, like they already have their money on EOAs and switching all their balances and all their, all their NFTs and everything is just too much for them usually. So we were thinking quite a bit about, okay, like how can we um, develop a kind of abstraction more? How can we perhaps enshrine it a bit? And so some ideas just floating around, again, there's no EIP set and there's no like specific roadmap set. But an example is um, making a new transaction type, which converts an EOA to um, a smart contract that you specify in the data field, right? And this basically should be quite a simple um, new transaction type. Um, there's not really that much complexity as far as I can tell, but please love to hear some comments. Some more advanced ones 
and again, just ideation, is um, perhaps making an EIP which converts all um, current EOA accounts into a sort of um, default proxy smart contract wallet, which uses the current ECDSA um, signature scheme that EOA is already used, right? And another sort of more advanced one is, um, so this ERC-4337, it works with a so-called entry point smart contract, which is through which uh, you route all your user operations to interact with your wallet. And this costs a lot of gas because you do all the signature verification, all the, um, all, all the stuff uh, on chain using, well, EVM opcodes, right? So what if instead you made this part of the protocol, right, and um, that could be validated outside. And so we would save users lots of gas. Any last comments? Oh yeah, just real quick, this isn't on that, but uh, it hasn't been suggested for Shanghai, but prior to the merge, it had a bit of support, uh, time aware base fee calculation. It would essentially just make 1559 quite proof of stake friendly. 1559 is aware of blocks, it's not aware of slots. You could have say like an empty block with proof of work, but now you can have missed block proposal, so here we go. I think with the, with the amount of missed slots we see right now, I don't think it makes sense to, to do it now. Uh, it's it's like I don't know we're we're seeing like point point one percent uh, point zero one percent of missed slots or something like this. It would be a negligible improvement to UX, so yeah, just for a clean up, but not necessarily to have. So uh, with the wallet, uh, I think there was three proposals. Uh, I just wanted to mention there was one proposal where uh, you said that we could just auto-convert everything. Uh, no, that's not going to happen. Essentially, uh, that that's already a huge issue for vertical trees, where you just want to do an upgrade where the state just gets flipped over and it's a huge linear migration. And we have absolutely no idea how we're going to do it for vertical trees, so let's not do it twice. But what if it's not actually touching every account, and rather it's there's no code, and there's a message signed from that account, and it's treated as a default account, and so it falls back to some default code. But that would actually break the new semantics that we introduced with. Right. You know which which yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that no EOA can also have contract code. But there's no code in the account. And so it's already empty. And so it would basically be like me sending a transaction and rather than executing it the same way that we do today, it would realize that the recovered address has no code in it. And so then it would just start executing it in an EVM frame with some default account code that implements the same concept of an ECDSA uh, account. Okay, I couldn't follow. So so you wouldn't set the, set the contract code? On you would not set the contract code. Okay. It's a fallback. I see. You have a final comment, Peter? Okay. Okay, I think we're going to wrap up. Uh, it's past six. Um, so, first of all, thanks everyone for coming. Um, there's more places we can discuss all this this week. So, we mentioned there's an EVM panel where we can get into EOF, 1153, all that good stuff. There's an account abstraction panel, uh, and we just had some new fresh account abstraction content as well. And then finally, there's an ERC uh, panel. kind of ETH magician session as well um, throughout the week. I don't know when they are, sorry, they're all on the agenda. The ERC session is on Friday at the workshop room 4 at 1 p.m. You heard it. Um, oh, Proto. Right. Uh, so on Friday, there's a session about dank sharding and proto dank sharding. If you're interested to help us with the EIP for it for far, just please contact us and we are hosting co work sessions. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. <laughs>